Welcome to the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Halloween Resurrection, released in 2002. This movie is the last in the line of continuity that goes from the original, to Halloween 2, to Halloween H2O, to this one. After this, the series would rest for five years before getting rebooted by Rob Zombie. Halloween Resurrection is another popular contender for Worst of the Series, which is interesting seeing as how it was directed by Rick Rosenthal, the same dude who helmed Halloween 2, a sequel that many people loved. And why why is Resurrection so widely panned? Well, maybe it's because it negates the excellent ending the series could have had with H2O's finale. Maybe it's because, in retrospect, the film's reliance on the burgeoning world of webcams and cyberspace seems quaint. Or maybe it's because it features rapper Buster Rhymes as a reality TV host and karate enthusiast. All of those things and many more missteps contribute to another Halloween I wish I could just run away from. But at least it's got some decent kills, which we will now get to. The movie begins at a new sanitarium where Laurie Strode is hanging out, wearing another wig and reminiscing about the time she murdered her brother three years ago. Yeah, remember that. This one nurse sure does, cause she's got a whole lot of exposition to give. Which includes explaining how, on the night of H2O's events, a paramedic was attacked by a still-living Michael Myers, who then took his outfit and watched as Laurie drove off in a coroner's van with the wrong body inside. Yeah, let's go ahead and get the other half of that H2O kill. It wasn't Michael Laurie murdered, it was actually this random paramedic, who couldn't say anything because because Michael had crushed his voice box. It's a super disappointing retcon to me and many other fans, but it was actually planned all along, since Mustafa Akkad said he didn't want Michael killed definitively, the better to make more sequels. Kevin Williamson actually came up with this idea during the production of H2O, and they filmed the reveal right after rapping on that movie. But Jamie Lee Curtis insisted that the shots not be included in H2O, so audiences could actually believe that she had killed Michael Myers for at least a few years. Now Laurie Strode is pretending to be catatonic for the hospital staff, and stuffing a baby doll full of the pills she's supposed to be taking. Gotta be vigilant for Michael's inevitable return, which just so happens to be tonight. Mike enters the building and passes up some vending machines that probably have those dope-ass potato skins in them. And when a couple of security guards go to check out the disturbance, the first one, Franklin, is killed off-screen after mistaking Michael for an inmate. His scream is heard by his co-worker, Willie, who opens a big clothes dryer to find Franklin's head. And what does Willie trip over right afterward? Hey, it's Franklin! Just, you know, without a head. Michael repeats his H2O workout routine, to get down behind Willie, who he then grabs by the back of his head and kills with a classic throat slit using his knife. Aw damn, I was hoping Willie would get a more exciting kill here. With the guards out of the way, Michael first person walks down a hallway and echoes another H2O shot before first person raging his way through the door to Lori's room, head first. Yeah, that door ain't shit! But Lori is waiting for him with a lamp to the head and then takes off down the hallway, her douchey older brother in hot pursuit. They wind up on the roof where Michael gets a surprise greeting from his baby sis. Hello, Michael. Apparently, this idiot just walked straight into a trap that Lori had somehow set using an industrial crane. Yeah, I'm sure an inmate could whip that up real fast. The trap leaves him hanging upside down over the edge of the building, so Lori confronts him and asks him why he's such a shitty sibling. As she goes to cut the rope to send him down to certain not death, Michael grabs at his mask, triggering some trauma in Lori that comes to her in the form of a desaturated flashback. To ensure she's got the right victim this time, Lori goes to remove Michael's mask. I just have to be sure. But, oh, too close. He grabs her right as the rope breaks, and the two of them swing down over the edge of the building. Michael stabs Lori in the back, and yeah, man, this is actually the end of Lori Strode in this timeline. She gives him a kiss and says she'll see him in hell before her body falls down into the trees below. Good thing this new movie is bringing her back and pretending resurrection never happened, because this is not the way Lori should be going out. Michael plants the knife on a very willing inmate wearing a clown mask who's obsessed with serial killers so much that he can recite Michael's backstory. Michael Myers killed three high schools students October 31st, 1978. Also killed three nurses and a paramedic same night. Man, people always be forgetting about that poor mechanic. It's where Michael got his threads, dude. Michael leaves the asylum and walks straight into a title card. Halloween Resurrection. <laughs> At Haddonfield University, an upgrade from the junior college in Part 6, I guess, director Rick Rosenthal cameos as Professor Mixter, who has the same name as that drunk doctor in Halloween 2, so that's fun, I guess. He's teaching Boogeyman 101 to a bunch of sleepy students and our final girl Sarah, who, like many final girls before her, is SMRT and is able to correctly answer her teacher's questions, so he knows she ain't going to die later. While riding a moped through a crowded pedestrian walkway, Sarah is stopped by her friend Jen, who's got some good news for her. Looks like the two of them and their culinary 
naturally inclined friend Rudy have been selected. For what, you may ask? Why, as a member of Dangertainment, of course, where they'll be on a reality show of sorts. It's like we're investigative reporters searching a crime scene. Their investigation will be done at the old Myers house, as this random panty-sniffing weirdo exposits to them before randomly shrieking. <laughs> what? Who the fuck even was that guy? Store brand Stu Mocker? Jen wants to do this to get exposure for a hopeful career in broadcasting, while Sarah is reluctantly doing it for a scholarship or something? It doesn't matter, it's dumb. Sarah messages her cyber friend Deckard to tell him all about it, but turns out Deckard's real name is actually Miles, and he's a freshman who's been posing as a grad student in his interactions with Sarah. His inclusion in this movie is one giant fucking question mark, and he's got some serious cyber delusions to boot. It's kinda like we're dating. No, it's not. No, 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 it's not. But you can imagine what it'd be like if we were. At the Dangertainment production meeting, the six cast members are briefed by the people in charge, Freddie and Nora, played by, holy shit, can you believe it? Busta Rhymes and Tyra Banks. Yeah, uh, please clap. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, come on, keep it going. A bunch of interviews introduce the side characters and their quirks, and it's sad that most of them are more interesting than Sarah, who we're supposed to care about for some reason. But at least she can scream. So that makes Busta like her, but it's actually ironic, because actress Bianca Kalick had to have all her screams dubbed in because of a quote, inability to scream. I feel you, Bianca, I can't scream either. It comes out more like an excited yell. <laughs> that night, while Busta is busting a nut over Jackie Chan's kung fu skills, Sarah visits him and tries to get out of the whole thing, saying she doesn't even want to be famous. What do you mean you don't want to be famous? That's the American dream. Freddie convinces her to stay without too much effort, and she leaves, which to me shows that this scene's only purpose was to set up Busta's kung fu bullshit later. The next day, Freddie shows everyone the cameras they'll be wearing, which are immediately used exactly as you'd expect. You know, I will hand it to this movie for getting ahead on this stuff. In 2002, not many people knew what live streaming was, so I'll reluctantly give the film some credit for being that forward-thinking. Meanwhile, from the Myers house garage, Norma is directing her crew member Charlie as he sets up cameras throughout the house's interior. She gets to distracted, dancing to her espresso machine, so she doesn't notice when Michael shows up and grabs one of the cameras to use its tripod legs as a weapon against Charlie. <laughs> what was that spiky tripod made for? Filming soccer matches? In any case, Michael uses it to stab Charlie straight through the throat, killing him with a fair amount of gore that's all captured on the video feed being ignored by Norma thanks to her espresso con pana. That sucks, Charlie, and for a web-based reality show? No way you were getting paid union rate. The cast goes to the Myers house and gears up with all their cameras, while Freddie tells a bunch of reporters how groundbreaking his reality web series is. Yeah, too bad Big Brother was already a thing by now, dude. The kids all enter the Myers house, and our premise is afoot. The six of them are now expected to stay overnight here while looking for clues to learn why exactly Michael Myers turned out the way he did. They find lots of things right off the bat. A big scary kitchen knife, a toddler's high chair with leather restraints on it, Michael Myers holding a bloody knife. Oh, wait, nope, they actually missed that one. Not the clue you want to miss, y'all. After the sun goes down, they light a bunch of candles and explore the house for Further, including Judith's room where she was stabbed to death. Careful there, Jen, you about to trigger some nasty old Mikey memories. Sideplot Miles and his buddy Scott head to an upperclassman Halloween party dressed as Vincent Vega and Jules Winfield, thankfully without any blackface involved. But Miles is such a nerd, he can't help but find the family's office and log on to the World Wide Web, even though I don't remember him getting any parents' permission. <laughs> I love webcam stuff, it's so unpolished and real. In no time at all, he's got Freeberg from Freddy vs. Jason and a whole bunch of other party people watching the stream with him, so that means all of them should have seen the next kill as it happened. The victim of that murder is Bill, whose only character trait is to be a big ol' perv like 100% of the time. As he's looking into a mirror, he gets killed by Michael Myers, somehow crashing through it from behind and stabbing him a couple of times. His final fateful stab is to the top of Bill's head, killing him for good, but here's the thing, we never see Miles or the people at the party react to it at all. What do they see and why doesn't the movie show us? That's just bad storytelling. We do see Freddy and Norma complain about Bill's camera being down, but they didn't see the kill itself since they were too busy toasting themselves for getting OBS to run properly. Annoying psych major Donna and Curtis Armstrong impersonator Jim head to the basement where she pedantically corrects him on his use of the word continuously and calls him names that are sexy and esoteric. Sexoteric? 
You're such a Lothario. Of course, she's still down to see his Lothario face, so she goes to make out with him. But before they go any further, Jim's gotta metaphorically fuck this floor with an escape room key they found that gives them access to a hatch. Anyone else hear Mama Cass playing down there? But instead of finding any buttons to push, Donna and Jim just find some creepy chains in the wall, and, surmising that there surely must not be any cameras down here, they remove the POV webcams from their heads and disrobe to get to some underground dry humping, not realizing that their webcams fell in a way to capture it all for everyone watching to see. Right as their 56k porn gets going, a wall breaks behind them and they get covered in a bunch of spoopy skeletons. Don't worry though, these old bones aren't authentic. They were planted there by Freddy and Norma. They did it for the views! And it doesn't take long for Jim to discover that they're getting had, since he sees a Made in Taiwan stamp on one of the bones. And upstairs, Sarah, Jen, and Rudy are starting to catch on too, since they keep finding overly spooky stuff like a mannequin with a mask on it, some scribbled on coloring books, and Sid's baby doll from Toy Story, which is like in lots of different horror movies I'm noticing. I mean, all of this is not right. It's too easy. Yeah, you're right, Rudy. Buster Rhymes has got you all in check, and he's about to take it to the next level by dressing up like Michael Myers to scare everyone. I actually really enjoy this scene where Buster finds real Michael stalking him and mistakes him for slain crew member Charlie. And why the hell you dress like me anyway? I'm playing Michael Myers. If them kids come around and see us dressed up in the same shit, you're gonna ruin the whole effect! Basically, Freddy is saying, there's too much of us, it's dangerous. And unlike the mistaken identity scene in part 5, this one makes me laugh. Probably because of how committed Buster Rhymes is to yelling at Michael Myers. You need to get the hell out of here! <laughs> I also love that it works in the end, and Michael goes off to start a new career in Hollywood. He's gonna be pissed when he finds out he has to start with PA work, though. After Jim leaves the basement in anger, Donna hears a noise and unwisely follows it through a sewer tunnel? into an area that isn't fake spooky, it's just regular spooky, complete with newspaper clippings of Laurie Strode and actual dead rats that I guess Michael's been nominated. on. The lights go out on Donna, and Michael Myers appears, and this time we see the livestream audience react, laughing since they don't think it's real. But it is, and Donna is killed when Michael corners her against an old wrought iron gate and impales her through the back on one of its, uh, I, I don't know, gate spokes or whatever. I guess Dangertainment needs to change the name of this thing to Myers House Deadstream. Get it? Instead, instead of livestream? Although everyone else at the party thinks it was a Jimmy Kimmel style prank, Miles believes it was legit. Haha, <laughs> this dude still thinks he's relevant to this movie, idiot. Freddy, dressed as Michael Myers, comes out of the shadows and attacks Sarah. But after Jim comes out of nowhere and knocks him down, Freddy breaks kayfabe and tells them all to turn off the cameras, much to the dismay of all those party kids watching the stream. Freddy unmasks himself and says it was just a prank bro, chill out, and that they can all get a cut of the cash money this web series is somehow making if they continue to play along. He remasks and runs off tee -hee to himself, so the cameras come back on, and although Sarah and Rudy say they're donezo with this charade, they turn back after Jen finds Bill's body and starts screaming bloody murder. She must be going for the first internet Emmy. Um, they're called the Streamies, dude. And the only thing Jen is earning right now is a rightful place on the kill count, since real Michael steps out and decapitates her with a single swing from his chef's knife. The head rolls down the stairs, alerting Sarah and the others that this is for real. Ain't no faking a beheading like that. I, I mean, if it happened in person. Obviously, you can fake it for a movie, we just saw that happen. The others are locked inside the house as Michael slowly approaches, and when Jim tries to ward him off using a tripod, Michael stops him and kills him. But not with the chef's knife, no siree Bob. Today he'll be going for a part 4 style head crunch that he once used to kill fellow Lothario Brady. After Michael lifts Jim up off the ground, he just squeezes the life out of him with his bare hands. But all I can think of right now is how none of this movie's characters are memorable in the least bit. Jim who? Although there are two victims left for Michael to choose from, he saves the last dance for Sarah and goes after Rudy instead, who leads him to the kitchen because that's his character's one trait. But after briefly fighting back with a rolling pin and some pocket spice, Rudy's order is up, and Michael kills him by grabbing Rudy's knife-holding hands and stabbing him with them off screen. Then he lifts Rudy up off the ground and stabs him through the wall with them. For a final bit of structural integrity, he grabs another knife from the drawer and sticks that through Rudy as well. It's yet another wall decoration kill for Michael, and honestly, the lack of variety in his carnage is frustrating when you binge watch the series. Give me murder artist Mr. Boy he's any day. Sarah pleads into a camera for help and then gets the idea to call her cyber sideplot buddy Deckard, who is Miles, lest you forget. Yeah, it's your time to shine, dude! You can finally graduate from subplot to subpar plot. Through the power of the house's multicam setup, Miles is able to text directions to Sarah so she can avoid Michael Myers. Kind of like one of those video games where one player has an overhead view and they're directing the others who are first person. I'm thinking of Battlefield 2, for example, but also, I'm old. With Miles' help, Sarah is able to get out onto the roof of the house, but Michael figures out where 
where she went and headbutts the window like a dude just asking for a face full of glass. He slashes her on the leg as she escapes to higher ground and into the attic, where she kicks off the final girl thing, finding Charlie's corpse up there and having to crawl over bills on her way down out of the attic. Before she can leave the house, though, she gets pulled aside by Freddy, who, oh yeah, is still alive, I guess. I mean, he's gotta be alive, cause he's still gotta be in one of the most maligned scenes in the entire Halloween franchise. Michael finds them, and the two men get into a fight, which is fine at first, but then Freddy stares Michael down and summons his inner Jackie Chan. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, you didn't ask for any Kung Fu Buster rhymes? Well, too bad, that's what you getting! <laughs> Try doing a flip kick, Freddy. Flip mode is the greatest. The fight ends with Freddy kicking Michael out of the window, which sends him crashing through a bunch of camera angles until he's left hanging from the second story. But then Sarah gets a text from Miles that shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody. Looks like Michael cut himself down from the cable and is now standing right behind you, Freddy! Oh, he takes one stab and is like, give me some more. But the second puts him down on the ground and takes him out. Sarah runs off for another little chase scene that ends with her in the garage, where some gasoline gets spilled and she winds up slipping in a big puddle of blood, in another reference to director Rosenthal's Halloween 2. Turns out this blood belongs to Norma, who Sarah finds hanging from the ceiling. I'm not entirely sure what did her in, because we only get that one shot of her body. We need more coverage, girl. When Michael follows Sarah into the garage, she attacks him with a chainsaw and delivers some shitty vengeance dialogue. This is for Jack! This is for First she cuts him, and then she cuts a whole bunch of wires hanging there, and the resulting sparks start a fire with the gas on the ground that of course ends up being a big explosion that just engulfs the entire damn place in flames. During the mayhem, Michael is knocked down, but he does his patented sit-up behind Sarah and is all ready to finally kill her once and for all when in bust us Freddy for another infamously bad moment. Trick or treat. Motherfucker. Side note, I swear I didn't remember that line when I said it in my trick or treat kill count last year. Trick or treat, motherfucker. I didn't plagiarize you, Mr. Rhymes. Please don't bust my ass. Freddy hits Michael with a shovel, twirls the handle around all fancy schmancy, and punches him in the face a few times before Michael is done playing around and just throws him against a wall. But Busta comes back with some jewels to the jewels and sends Michael stumbling into a canopy of electrocution. With the serial killer all tied up, Busta takes the opportunity to grab our final girl and spit out one final quip. Happy fucking Halloween! He takes off and leaves Michael there to die, which of course means that Michael ain't gonna die. Sarah gets a text from Miles congratulating her on her final girl status, and she thanks him live on the news, allowing this movie to pretend his character was necessary and not just a way to pad a good 15 minutes onto the runtime. Freddy jumps into a news camera frame to give Michael a puzzling eulogy. Michael Myers is a killer shark baggy ass overalls. And the movie ends with a coroner scene, where the very fucking expected plays out, with the coroner opening up the body bag and Michael opening up his eyes. Wow, shocking. How many kills did Michael get on his first live stream? And more importantly, did anyone send any super chats for him? Let's find out and get to the numbers. <laughs> There were ten and a half kills in Halloween Resurrection, the half coming from the paramedics since we already counted half of him at the end of H2O. The victims included six and a half men coming to CBS this fall, and four women, giving us an almost even pie chart. With a runtime of 90 minutes, that gives us a kill on average every 8.57 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Charlie. It was the most unique kill since it was done with a tripod, and the gore effects weren't bad either. Plus, you get so many angles of it, it's an editor's dream. Contrast that with the dull machete, which will go to Norma, who had a single shot showing the results of her off-screen death. Sorry, Norma, you are not America's next top body. And that's it. Halloween Resurrection came out in 2002 and was so poorly received they just scrapped the whole series and let Rob Zombie remake it from scratch. We'll look at his Hellbilly Halloween next week. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this week's Kill Count. I want to thank a couple of patrons like Leon Rofs, Jason Paterson, and Velvet Ruby. And that's the end of Michael Myers' timeline too. All we've got now are the two Rob Zombie movies ahead of us. And then that new one in theaters that I can't wait to come out next week. Remember though, I can't do it until it's out on Blu-ray. And that doesn't mean I promise to do it right when it comes out on Blu-ray. Looking at you, Fallen Kingdom. Thanks y'all, be good people.